Well, it has been a privilege to see Dr. Allman again. I, I was remembering back when I was a student in Crichton, back in the, the fall of 88. I remember one evening in particular, I was driving along. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. It was the north leg of I, the 240 loop there in Memphis, and I'd been watching a movie with a friend. And for some reason, I thought, I'm going to get off at Covington Pike here and go ahead and return the movie tonight. And as I got off the interstate, it was late at night, and you know how quick you're going on a ramp. Suddenly, this woman appears in the middle of the lane, waving her arms. And, and I slammed on the brakes and skidded all the way up to her and just barely bumped her. And she ran to my window, and, and her eyes were blackened, and she's screaming and hollering. And she says, he's trying to kill me. And she keeps pointing down to the, the Wolf River bottoms that ran right next to the, the interstate there. And I said, who's trying to kill you? And she said, he's trying to kill me. And suddenly this truck, this four-wheeler, comes up out of the Wolf River bottom and lands right on the road there. And this guy's screaming out the window at her. And she says, please let me in. I didn't know what to do. I really didn't. So finally I said, get in the car. So she jumps in the car. I had this old Honda. We're driving along while this guy, this maniac, just, he keeps coming beside us in his truck screaming at her and screaming at us. And, and I'm just driving panicked as fast as I can. There's no cars out. I keep hoping we'll see a police officer or somebody. And I said, who is that? And she said, I, I don't know. I don't know. I said, you don't know? <laughs> and finally, I, just out of an act of grace, he gets tired of it. He jumps the curb and he does a U-turn and goes the other direction. And I start calming down a little bit and we're driving along and I said, you don't know who that is? We need to go to the police and report him. She said, I, I don't know his name. I said, you don't know his name? I said, what are you doing with him in the middle of the night in the Wolf River bottoms and you don't even know who he is? Suddenly kind of, the light kind of went off for me. <laughs> and I didn't mean to say it out loud, but I just went, you're a prostitute. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I am. And I thought, oh, this is great. <laughs> so how was your night? Oh, well, about one o'clock I <laughs> picked up a prostitute. <laughs> and so we're driving along. I said, where can I take you? And she said, well, here, let me give you directions. And as we're driving, I thought, well, at least I, I got to make the most of this situation. And I started to share with her the gospel. And I got a few sentences in and she said, I don't want to hear that. And it really made me mad. I said, I, I don't care. It comes with the ride tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so we kept talking. <laughs> and I kept sharing. And as I, as I was sharing it, suddenly she stopped me. And she began to share the entire gospel message back to me. She knew the truth. And she started sharing about a childhood raised in a Baptist home with godly parents. I said, how, how did you end up here? She said, oh, some bad choices. A couple of kids trying to survive. And right at that moment in her story, we, we came to an intersection right at Poplar, or right at White Station in summer there in Memphis, and she said, stop the car, and I stopped, and I, th I thought we were going to her house, but I looked up, and there was a strip club. She got out of the car. I said, you're going back to work, aren't you? She said, you, you just pray for me, sweetie. And then she walked off. And I remember as I first took off, I punched the dashboard. I was so frustrated. I thought, how could she know the truth and live like that? And I was just so frustrated before God. But right in that moment, the Holy Spirit started convicting me about the truth I knew, about the classes I was taking under a Dr. Allman, and the Greek I was getting to study in Bible college, about the foundation of systematic theology I had, of the truth that I had every day that I was getting to be immersed in, and the question just kept coming back to me, 
Do you live the truth you know as much as you're expecting her to live the truth she knows? It's a humbling moment. I, I think of that moment when I get frustrated with people and I don't want to extend grace. I think of that moment when I read James 3 and he says, let not many be teachers because of the judgment you'll incur, because of the truth you know, because of the responsibility you have. I think of it when I think of Dallas Seminary. You know, we've talked about Dallas as a wild ride and an arduous journey, but we need to recognize as well it's a dangerous place. It's like a nuclear power plant is a dangerous place. A profitable place, a place that produces much power for the sake of the world, but they have to be careful at a nuclear power plant because every day they're handling radioactive material. And they can't afford to not treat it with care. And I would say the same thing for Dallas and for ministers and for anybody who is serving the kingdom day in and day out. It's a dangerous thing we do because we handle something powerful every day. The Word of God. And we can't afford to be careless with it. We can't afford to lose what I call a ministry must have, the wonder for God's Word. And yet it is so easy in a place, even like Dallas, that is built on God's Word to lose the very wonder and awe that we need to have for what he's given us. How do we regain that? How do we protect it? How do we hold on to that? How do we go through seminary without losing it, without losing this critical distinctive? Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 to a very familiar passage. It's one of our proof texts as those who hold to the inerrancy of God's Word. And yet, even in it, we see Paul's admonition to Timothy on how we can handle this, how we can be ministers, how we can be men and women who every day interact with it without losing it, without losing the wonder and the awe and the reverence that's needed for God's Word. First thing I would say to you that we see in it and, and how we can do so is just to remember again how remarkable it really is. Just stop for a moment and just, just remember like you did the first time how remarkable God's Word is. Look at, look at the first statement from 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is God-breathed. It's God's Word. The fact that God would actually speak to humanity, the fact that He would take the care that men were moved by the Holy Spirit to speak for God, the fact that He's given it to us with such accuracy, the fact that we have so much of it, all Scripture, it's God's communication to us. At some point, there's a place where we just need to remember again how remarkable it is. Sometimes with our familiarity, we lose that. You know, I told you yesterday that I was a tour guide at Graceland, Elvis Presley's house, Graceland. This was in the late 80s. Graceland hadn't been in operation very long. It's not nearly the operation it is now. And as a result, it was all these college students who were tour guides who would get bored doing tours and would think of things that we could do all day that would be fun and play with Elvis's stuff. You go there now, it's all behind glass cases and, and everything, the lighting and the temperature. Then we were doing tours and his clothes were on racks and they were all out. And so, so when it would get kind of calm, especially in the winter, we were always playing with this stuff. <laughs> Trying on a jumpsuit, you know, to see what it would be like. And... <laughs> I had a friend, Tommy. Tommy and I would always dare each other all the time to try to do something. Make up stuff and just put it in the tour and act like Elvis had done it and see if people would believe it. And, yeah. <laughs> So Tommy and I dared each other one day, would we wear something of Elvis's all day? And so we went over to his shoes, and, and, and Elvis and I have very little in common, but we have the same shoe size. And so I took off my shoes and put on Elvis's penny loafers all day. And I'm walking around in them, doing tours in them. Tommy was a little more bold, he put on the bowling shoes. 
Yeah, about halfway through the day, he got caught by management walking around in Elvis's bowling shoes. <laughs> Emergency meeting, we're all called in. We're told if we ever touch anything of Elvis's again, we're fired on the spot. Now, I'm standing there in his penny loafers at the time <laughs> listening to it. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to make my way back, switch out the shoes, and, and no one was wiser. You know, I was amazed a few years later. I saw an auction at Sotheby's of some of Elvis's paraphernalia and some of his clothes. And there were items like shoes going for $40,000, $50,000. And these people were bidding for it because these things had been attached to Elvis and they were so valuable. And then I remember again, Paul's telling us this is attached to God. God breathed. It's communication right from Him. And do I step back and go, whoa, that's so valuable. That's so remarkable that He lets me interact with it and know it and come to a place like this and study it every day. Do I hold on to the wonder of it while at the same time investigating both the science and the art. I think sometimes it's hard, and, and we lose it in seminary as you grow in the science of it, as you grow in your hermeneutics, as you learn how the books were written, as you learn how to parse it, as you learn the original context, as you grow in those valuable tools of the science of understanding God's Word. But do I hold on to the art of it as well? The, the beauty of the big picture the message that's being communicated. You know, Leonard Sweet talks about the Prince of Grenada who was an heir to the throne of Spain. And another heir to the throne captured the throne and he immediately put the prince in the prison of Madrid, the place of the skull, and he placed him there for 33 years until he died. And the only item he had with him was a Bible for 33 years. At the end of 33 years, as they went to clean out his cell, they found scratchings on the wall of notations from the Bible. Listen to some of his notations. After 33 years, he wrote that Psalm 118.8 is the middle verse of the Bible. Ezra 7.21 contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. The ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Esther is the longest verse in the Bible. No word or name more than six syllables can be found in the Bible. After 33 years, all he had was Bible trivia. He knew facts about it, but he, he never saw the story. He never saw the communication. I don't want to lose that balance as I grow in the science of understanding it with the art and the beauty of what God's communicated to me. Uh, my first year in college, I was bouncing around with majors, and I did film study for a year. And I remember learning how they made films, and they edited it, and lighting, and direction, and it about ruined me on movies. Every time I'd go to watch a movie, I could no longer enjoy the story of it anymore because I kept thinking, oh, that's how they cut that scene. Huh, the lighting, they did that. wonder why they had them enter like that. Oh, they shot it from this direction. At some point, I'd lost the ability to hear the message and the meaning of the movie while I was looking at all the details and the science of it. I don't want to lose that with God's Word. I don't want to always open it and, and just see context or just see sermon outlines that I can preach to someone or just parse the words, all of which, which is valuable, but with that knowledge... I don't want to lose my faith. I don't want to lose the reverence of how remarkable the message really is. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, all of us that work with God's Word every day, I pray you learn the science to the best of your ability. I pray you learn the languages. I pray you learn the context. I pray you get this book and you know it inside and out and you're in the place to do it. But with it, don't lose the message. Don't lose the beauty. Don't lose the fact that God communicated to it 
to us. Remember how remarkable it is. The second thing we see is we need to recognize how powerful it is. Recognize how powerful it is. He says, all Scripture is inspired by God. And look what it can do. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Look at the power that this book has to be able to teach people so they can grow. To be able to correct where they've gone the wrong course. To be able to set them on the right place. To be able to train them in righteousness. What a powerful statement. To be trained in righteousness that I can actually experience life change. I don't have to be stuck in the life that I was in. I don't have to be a slave to sin. I can know the truth and be free in it and live a life that God says, yes, this book has the ability and the power to do that. I was reminded a couple of years ago we were preaching through Revelation. And I was preaching through Revelation 3 and, and the letter to the church of Sardis. You know that verse in the letter to the church of Sardis 3, 5, the promise to the overcomers that they'll be clothed in white and that their name will not be erased from the book of life. I had a friend that was on the vocal team, he's actually a hero of mine, who has been through a hard journey in his faith. He struggled with some significant recovery struggles. And, and he's a hero for the daily choices he makes in that. I love that guy. And he was singing that day, and when he saw that passage, as he sat on the front row, he started trembling because he came from a background that had taught him you could lose your salvation. In fact, that verse had been hammered into him since childhood. You better be an overcomer. If you sin too much and you're not an overcomer, your name gets erased. You're out. You're not going to make it. And as he sat there on the front row, I didn't know this fact. He was sitting there. His heart's just beating. And he's scared to death of this verse. And then I said the phrase, and he who overcomes your name will not be erased from the book of life. And immediately those old voices that came back to him said, you're not an overcomer. You're not going to make it. And in that moment, what I thought was just a, a kind of throw-in passage, it really wasn't the main part of it, I said, hey, in case you want to know what an overcomer is, and, and he kind of leaned forward, I said, you know, the same writer of this book wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he tells us over in 1st John 5, and I just flipped over real quick, I said, who is the one who overcomes the world? And, and he's listening like it's the first time. And John answers, he who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. And his heart broke as he started crying. For the first time in his life, he recognized he was an overcomer, not because of him, but because of Christ. For the first time he could stand up to those voices and those fears and have an identity that says, I am an overcomer because of what Jesus Christ has done. And I didn't know what was going on. He's just sitting there bawling. I had just read a verse. But when he told me the story, it reminded me again the power, not of my preaching, not of my thoughts, the power for life change is in this book. And people need it because they want to be free. They want hope for their lives. People want to be righteous before God. They really do. God's put that desire in His children. And we get the privilege every day of being in it and studying it and unleashing it. There's a place where we just need to step back and just remember how remarkable it is. There's a place we just need to recognize the power of God's Word that's there. And the final part I'd say to help us to keep from losing it, there's a place where we need to receive it personally. Not just give it, but receive it. Look what he says in verse 17. He says, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. 
Scripture's profitable. Not just for your teaching, not for just for what it does out there, not just for the righteousness it brings in them, but for the righteousness, Paul says, it brings in you, Timothy. So that you, as God's man, so that you as students here, as men and women who have given their lives to this, so that you can be, and I love the two terms, you can be both adequate and equipped. You can be the man that God's called you to be. You can actually be the woman God's called you to be. And you can do the ministry He's called you to do through the power of His Word. But there's a place where you've got to stop and receive it. To be teachable. To listen. To just take it in and read it and say, God, what are you speaking to me? To recognize again that, that I need the Word. I need it. Not just the people I minister to. Not just the people I talk to. I need it desperately. You know, I love that, that spoof, that commercial. I don't know if you saw it in the Super Bowl. It was either last year or two years ago. The takeoff, the FedEx takeoff on Castaway. Remember Castaway, the movie of Tom Hanks? He's a FedEx employee stranded on an island. He lives there for years. He finally gets off the island and he's held on to that FedEx package the whole time. And at the end of the movie, he brings it to the woman's doorstep and he gives her her package. The commercial does a takeoff. It shows him and he's bearded and he arrives at the doorstep. And he says, I've been stranded on an island for all these years, but I held on to this package. Here's your package. And as he goes to leave, he finally stops and he turns around and he says, just curious, what, what was in the package? And she says, oh, nothing really. Just a satellite phone and a global positioning system and a water purifier and some seeds. <laughs> he kind of walks away. I mean, all that time, that's just what he needed. He was carrying it around. And yet, I I'm reminded in ministry... There are days when I'm, I'm asking God, God, what am I going to do here? God, how are you going to work here? God, how's this going to work out? And I'm carrying this around every day. You carry it in your books every day. It's that package that has just what you need. Not just for your studies. Not just to write the paper what you need for your struggles, for your fears, for the days you just don't think you can make it. He's got words here that are just for you. Will we receive it and open it? Will we choose to live it Really live it. Receive it and then live it out. And where I'm not living out, be convicted by it. About a year ago, I, I was headed to church and, and I was teaching a class. We have a class called Explore. It's an outreach class. We just invite people from the community and walk them through a, an apologetic presentation. In the second half of the class, just answer questions. And, and so I was geared down on my lesson. I was headed by the coffee shop. I was going to get a big venti coffee get juiced up on caffeine, ready for everybody's questions. And I was driving along, and, it, and right when I came to a stop sign, I look over, and there's a guy in his Jeep with his little girl, and he's trying to start the Jeep. And I noticed him. His daughter was about my daughter's age, and, and I yelled out. It was a real hot day. I said, you okay? He said, oh, we'll be fine. I think we're out of gas. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's a shame. You know, and I, I got to head on to church. And right when I turned that corner, God brought back his word. Suddenly the story of the Good Samaritan just went pow. And, and, and the exact passage he used in it, I remembered suddenly that Levite and the priest, two professional church workers who were so busy in their ministry, they never could stop. And I thought, oh, come on, God, that's not fair. <laughs> And even I saw the coffee shop that was there and there was a gas station and I thought, okay, okay. 
and I, I really, I had a bad attitude, and I pulled into the gas station and kind of poked my head in the door. I said, do y'all sell gas cans? And the girl goes, no, we don't. I said, you got a gas can? She said, no, we don't. And I thought, well, I tried. <laughs> and suddenly this other girl that was over at the subway counter yells out to me, I could empty out the pickle jar if you like. <laughs> and I wanted to say, no, I really don't like. <laughs> sure, that'd be great. So she dumps out the pickles and she washes it out. I mean, she's got a better attitude than I do. And I go out and I get a jar full of gas. <laughs> and I show back up with my jar full of gas and the guy's kind of looking at me weird. And we, we find some cardboard, make a funnel and get the gas in it. And, and I show up at my class just reeking of gasoline. It's like, hey, I want to tell you about Christ. And people are like, yeah, great. God's word's powerful. And there's, there's a place where we just need to stop and when he brings it to us and he says, you're not living it here. Do you really know that? Do you really believe that? Do you believe what you're studying so much that you'll receive it? That you'll live it, not just preach it? That you'll really believe what you're studying. You know, a couple of months ago, I got up real early one morning and I was trying to memorize scripture. I had my list of to-do and I was stressed out of all these things I had to do. I was paying bills and all these things and I made a goal to memorize some scripture and I opened John 14, 1 and no lie, I sat there memorizing John 14, 1. Do not let your heart be anxious. Believe in God, believe also in me. And I start saying it over. Do not let your heart be anxious. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Do not, I mean, stressed out to the max. <laughs> and finally, I just took a breath long enough that God went, hello. <laughs> Look at what you're reading. You know, believe in God. Believe in me. And I went, God, that's not my problem. I believe. Then why is your heart anxious? Do you believe in me enough that I can actually take care of your problems on your list? Believe in God. Believe in me. Grow in your knowledge, but don't lose the faith and the awe Grow in the science, but don't lose the wonder and the art. Capture a little bit again that childlike faith. You know, the best thing that God's done for my faith is give me kids. It really is. It's awakened a new world for me where they say and they do and they learn this and they actually believe it. We were teaching about eternity and talking about rewards. And my daughter, my five-year-old Kate, got so excited when she heard about mansions. She looked at me, she said, am I really going to have my own house? I said, honey, from what I understand, you are. And about a month later, we were at the dinner table and we were going through the day. And my wife, Lee, pointed out how Kate had been really kind to her little brothers that day. And I said, Kate... I am so proud of you. You know, when you do that, that makes Jesus so happy. And she put down her fork and she said, is he adding on to my house? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, and I, and I went to correct her, but then I put down my fork. And I thought, she really believes it. She really believes that what you do in this life has an impact on eternity. And I looked at her and I said, God, help me to guard that faith as she grows in knowledge. I said, God, help me to have that faith in the middle of my knowledge. 
my prayer for you is that you could grow in knowledge here, but don't lose your faith. You can learn the science, but don't forget the art and the message. Don't forget to just stop every so often and stand in wonder of the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your Word. Thank you that it's God-breathed, that it's accurate, that it's inspired that it's what we need. Lord, I pray for each of us here. I pray for professors. I pray for students. I pray for pastors. I pray for counselors and for ministers. Lord, I pray for those of us who handle this, this dangerous material every day, this powerful, powerful thing that you've given us in your word. Lord, help us to learn it well. But God, help us to love it well, too. Because it's yours. Lord, thanks for this time where we could stop. Thank you for this place, a place that takes some time every day and says, we want to worship you. And we want to just rest in your word. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.